Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll be discussing prison reform and reintegration with special guests, Amy Fedick, Executive Director of the Sentence, Sentencing Project in Washington, D.C., and Brian Kelly, CEO of the Prison Entrepreneurship Program, or PEP, in Texas. I'd like to thank you both for joining us. I'm, I, I was so looking forward to this uh, conversation. We have covered these issues over the last uh, years on a fairly continual basis, and each of your organizations has, has very unique contributions to make. So we want to share this with, with, uh, with everyone uh, around the world, uh, just sort of to do some stage setting. And, and this is just so stunning. There are over 2 million people in prison and prisons and jails in the United States. And we are the lead, world's leader in mass incarceration. There is disproportionate representation of men who are black and native. And it's also interesting, and this is, this is just stunning, that over the last 40 years, America's population has increased 43%. And its prison population has increased from 344,000 to 2.3 million, which is 670% increase. So we're all for law and order. But Amy, is this, is this system working? Absolutely not. It is broken from the front to the middle to the back. Uh, if we care about building healthy communities, communities that thrive, that communities that are going to bring us fully into the 21st century and the 22nd century, if we care about racial justice and equality in this country, we have to care about ending our system of mass incarceration. And we also have to ask ourselves, how are we a democratic nation? And I say a Democrat with a small g, we are a democracy. How are we the world's oldest and largest democracy? And yet we take away the freedom of more people than anybody else. And not only do, do we incarcerate more of our people, we incarcerate them for longer and longer periods of time than any of our sister nations. And then when they return to the community, we keep them in bondage so that the re-entry is incredibly difficult, so that the odds are stacked against them, and so that we are going to actually have to spend our taxpayer dollars on things that don't make our communities healthier, don't make them thrive, and in fact, throw away lives and opportunities. So we have to completely rethink this horrible experiment in mass incarceration and not only reform it, but transform it into something that makes our nation stronger, better, and more equal for everyone. Uh, I'm going to stay with you for, for a second, Amy, before uh, coming to you, Brian, because you're, you're on the healing side, um, whereas Amy's on the incarceration side. There's the intake, and then there's also the exiting. Um, but Amy, just sort of staying with you, I, I, I want to uh, ask you some, some really pointed questions. You know, we're all accustomed to uh, binary, black hats and white hats, right? Mm -hmm. uh, good guys and bad guys, right? And, and even those, those, um, those um, characterizations in terms of color are now coming under attack. Um, let's talk about that binary idea. Of, of good people and bad people, and and you know this 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 concern that there are bad people who you don't want to be exposed to, if you're a good person, um, could you just attack that that notion of how that is applied within within the prison system, because it is a notion that just seems to be so common sensible, but is it? Not in my experience. And I will say that I spent 20 years going in and out of prisons, meeting people. I've had thousands of clients as a lawyer who've been incarcerated. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who are sitting behind bars. And what I can tell you from my personal experience and also from the data that we have, the Sentencing Project does a lot of research, some, some of the seminal research in the field what we find in our incarceration system that as in most things in life, it's much more complicated. 
people want to see things in black and white, but we know in our experience of the world that that is not the case. And that's not the case in prison any more than it is outside. When we talk to people, when we see their backgrounds, we see that what brings people into prison in the United States, uh, yeah, folks have committed some crimes and some of them are very, very serious. But when we look at the backgrounds, what we see is untreated drug and alcohol abuse. What we see is histories of trauma. What we see are the people who come into prison. Some of the major drivers in our system are that untreated drug abuse, untreated mental health issues, untreated uh, former abuse status. For example, women in this country who are incarcerated. When we look at their backgrounds, we find 70, 80, 90% of women, before they get to prison, they were victims of physical or sexual abuse. And that those numbers are lower for men, but they are very, very high compared to the general population. So when we talk about perpetrators and victims, that's a duality that actually does not exist. It is much more mixed. So many of the folks who are in our prisons they were victims before they actually perpetrated a crime, but they never received the help or the assistance or the recognition in the community. So that trauma went untreated and what it morphed into was interactions with law enforcement. So we have to actually break that paradigm because it is a continuous cycle in and out of our community and in our places of incarceration uh, where we aren't actually helping victims of crime very much. Uh, we aren't actually dealing with trauma. And what we see is a flowering, unfortunately, of prison beds, prison construction, dealing with social problems and the lack of a social safety net through creating prison beds and, and a carceral state, which is the worst possible way you could actually deal with trauma and abuse and poverty. So, so Brian, you deal with people who are trying to turn their lives around. None of us, none of us think that there are not people for whom incarceration is necessary. Could you just comment on, on that idea? And then let's talk about people who it's, it, it's, it's time to help them change their lives and be part of, of society outside of prison. But, but could you just comment on, on this idea of, of how we should look at incarceration because there are some people that we would not want to be out. Um, you're, you're muted, I think. So sorry, yeah, I completely agree with you, Mark. Um, we have found in Texas at, at the Prison Entrepreneurship Program that there are many, I, by far the majority of the people who are in prison desperately want to turn their lives around. They just don't know how. They have come out of a community of poverty, generally, uh, and not just poverty as it relates to uh, economic opportunities, and food, housing, things like that, but a poverty of relationship as well, of somebody who would help them see a different vision for their life and help them get. You've, you, you've, uh, you've gone on to uh, mute again. Well, interesting. Okay, uh, we'll we'll try that again. Uh, uh, we we really want to provide opportunity uh, for the men inside of prison who desperately want to turn their lives around to do something, uh, so that that when they look in the mirror, uh, they really love the man that they see in the mirror. For most of them, they don't. And so, uh, most of our men in prison from their very survival on the street, tend to know a lot about business. They know about supply chains and distribution channels, risk management, profit margins, marketing, sales. They know how to read people well. They know um, how to take advantage or recognize opportunities. Now, they've used that negatively in the past. We want to teach them how to do that positively, and it's not that far of a jump. And so uh, most of our guys desperately want to turn their lives around. But to your point, Mark, there are some who are not ready, that they're in a desperate state still, and we need to protect society from them until that state changes, and we need to protect themselves uh, from that state. And so uh, I agree with you. There are some people that need removal from society for at least a period. I, I, I love your, your, um, your connection of business competencies 
mm -hmm. um, here to uh, people who are incarcerated. Because in my experience, it's, it, it really is true. Um, in impoverished neighborhoods, uh, in, in certain parts of America, uh, crime is a business. Um, it is a business that if, if done successfully, transfers wealth into the, the pocket of the perpetrators. So there's an actual payoff to, to, to that. And that, that wealth could be used uh, in different ways, right? And, and so in, in many respects, uh, you have people who have become skilled at something and they can continue to exercise those skills if not given other options. I mean, that's really what you're talking about. How do you create options for people and, and you also shift a sensibility around the equality between law-abiding acts and ways of accumulating wealth and non-law-abiding uh, ways of accumulating wealth. How do you do that? How do you shift that initial sensibility? Um, because punishment has created a certain amount of incentive not to be punished anymore, but there's also the whole idea of, of creating within, within the heart of someone a value structure that replaces a, a value structure that is that is completely dysfunctional. Yeah, it's interesting, Mark. The first thing we do is we show them what could be. And um, uh, the great example of that is my staff. I've got a staff at the Prison Entrepreneurship Program, about 30 people, 80% of which are ex-felons who have successfully navigated prison and re-entry and are doing well, are living a vibrant, triumphant life that includes, includes family life, engagement in the community, uh, increased earning potential. And when they go back and show what can be, and they say, you know, I was no different than you but my life is completely different. Let me show you how I did that. They're credible messengers with a message of hope and a new vision of what life can be like, but we also bring in an incredible uh, group of volunteers, people who have been successful in business, successful in life, to come in and show the guys how to think through problems that before would have been never be able to circumnavigate. And so we bring in successful people to, to coach and teach uh, people how to become successful people. And, you know, typically that's not a group of people that, who are going into prison with prison ministry. Um, and, and so and we're bringing in, uh, I don't know, I always call them the cool kids from school to talk about, you know, different ways. And, and it's amazing what happens is it impacts our volunteers as much as it does our participants, because um, most of our volunteers, and we've got a couple of events that really point this out, have had struggles in their past, have had brushes with the law, and but for the grace of God could very easily be wearing the uniform of the guys that are coming to visit. And so they recognize that, you know, but for a few breaks in life, my life could have turned out differently. So I think it's the great um, a commission of coming together uh, and recognizing uh, not just our differences, but what we have in common and how we can help each other overcome. You know, it's it, so often it starts with the relationships and how these organizations have built up the language. We, talk, we talked uh, earlier about trying to remove colorism from characterizations of, of uh, bad and good. Um, but also there's this whole issue of, of respect and how these organizations are built. Uh, Amy, Ta uh, 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 Brian was, was uh, mentioning that there is a real collaboration and it's basically a change that comes from the inside out from people who have had the experience sharing their experience with others. How is your organization built? Is it, is it built along hierarchical lines? Is it built, uh, is there a collaborative relationship that you have? with people who you serve? Um, how, how do you, how have you shaped your organization to, to convey uh, values of, of respect and, and um, leading toward uh, some sort of healing? Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, over 60% of our staff are directly impacted, either mm -hmm. uh, individuals who've been formerly incarcerated or family members. So we feel very personally the impact of the criminal legal system and keep that in mind in all the work that we do. But a lot of our work, in addition to the research uh, that we do is partnership with groups on the ground, local and state level groups that are working, uh, for example, to 
return voting rights to people who are justice impacted. We do a lot of work around voting rights. We also work to end extreme sentencing in this country, to roll back the, the decades and decades and life sentences that we've inflicted, not since the beginning of our history, but in the age of mass incarceration, where not only have we brought more and more people into the criminal justice system, but we keep them there for much, much longer times than we ever did before, despite the fact that the research in the United States and across the world demonstrates that people age out of crime. The vast majority of crimes committed between the ages, you won't be surprised, 17 and 24. Uh, but then people get older, they get tired, they don't really recidivate, they don't commit other crimes. And yet we in the United States, unlike our sister nations, keep people in prison for decades after they are any public safety threat. So we're working directly, especially with families on the ground whose loved ones are spending decades in prison uh, to start to reform laws, to, to pass second look legislation that allows people a chance at redemption the human dignity of proving that they can come home, that they don't need to spend 50 years in prison. So we're working hand in glove with family members on the ground, with people on the inside who wanna see another chance for themselves and the people that they know who are also ready to come home and for, for, with people who have returned home and are successfully th flourishing in the, in the community can demonstrate to the larger public, hey, I'm not unusual. There are thousands of others who are sitting in prison who could come home just like me and thrive and contribute to our families and our communities, but they're denied that chance because in the 70s and 80s, the United States expanded the harsh, overly punitive aspect of our laws, not, not for public safety reasons, not for any rational reason, but because of tough on crime political mantras that drove our legal system to become the harshest in the world, but I would say not the most effective. And we're going we're going through that cycle right now. Um, we just asked a, a, a poll question: Should those who have served time and do not reoffend have the same rights and privileges as other Americans? And Ninety-two uh, percent said yes. Eight percent said uh, no. Let's talk about the no side. You know, there's this this idea of of trust, right? Trust. Who do you trust? Uh, you can trust unconditionally. You can trust until, until one is disappointed. You can trust when, right? Trust when somebody proves themselves. You can never trust. It seems that in an effort to avoid mistakes, once somebody has um, been incarcerated, there, is a, there are a lot of people who just want to avoid a mistake. And uh, to them, the safest idea is to keep people locked away. And then once they get out, you sort of never trust. You never fully trust. Um, Brian, could you just comment on, on this idea of, of what do we do with people who have paid their debt to society, the old cliche, right? But there seems to be a, a, a sense within American society that that debt is never paid and, that, and punishment is, is ongoing. Um, could you just comment on that? Sure, I was going to ask the question, what does that mean that you paid your debt to society? Because I think in our population, uh, that, that debt is never paid. Uh, certainly, sometimes we do our sentences, but that carries on. And I would even push back and say every sentence in the United States is a life sentence because your background follows you every single place that you go. Banking, housing, transportation, um, relationships, employment. It is amazing to me how so many people in this country will say, oh yeah, I'm, you paid your debt. I, I want to welcome you back in, uh, but I don't necessarily want you to live next to me and I don't want you to work with me and I don't want you around uh, my kids. And, and, and well, you know, but there's all these roped off places we don't want you to go. So it's fine with me that you can be, come out and you work somewhere over there. And, I, and I'll tell you, I've seen your next poll question coming up, and I'm, uh, uh, I've had a brush with that personally because I'm not only a CEO of the Prison Entrepreneurship Program, I'm also a graduate. And Amy, I've done decades in prison. I did almost a 22-year stint. And it's amazing to me with a CEO title, walking in with a suit, 
I tried for a several month period to find a two bedroom apartment or condo uh, in the Dallas area. And, and when I'd walk in, it would be all smiles and, and handshakes and say, hey, we're looking forward to having you here. And as soon as they did a background check and found a 26 year old felony on my record, uh, I was shot out the door. It amazed me how everybody wanted me at first glance, but with something so old on my record, that there was not a chance. And educate us on the box. You know, we, we had a lot of discussions around, you know, uh, about the box issue in our program. Well, first describe, describe what it is. Uh, well, sure, there, there, there's a box on here. Hey, will you check this box if you've had a felony in your record? Uh, you know, that's automatic file 13 for most of the applications, whether that's for a job application or a uh, housing application. And so, you know, just admitting, uh, yeah, I've got a felony in my record. Very few times do you get to go to that next step of an interview and say, hey, can I explain that? And, and we teach our guys in our program to own it, own your background. Don't get stuck there, but own it and be prepared to say, you know what? I made a bad mistake, but I've learned from that. And what I've learned from that is this, and this is how you're going to benefit from the new Brian Kelly and, and be able to demonstrate how I can add value now because I went through those hard times and grew through it. But most people never get that chance if you check that box. Could you, could you both talk about sort of how criminal justice unfolds um, with this network of state and federal uh, regulations and how that affects the, the location in which you are living or uh, you are tried, um, uh, affects um, um, how you are incarcerated, how long you are incarcerated and what kind of support you receive. Um, so let's, let's start off with you, Amy. Um, how, how does geography, because we're supposed to be one country, we're supposed to have equal justice for all. How does geography, race, um, those kinds of factors um, affect sentencing? Every aspect of it. In this country, it, there is very much justice by geography and justice by race too, unfortunately. We have separate and unequal systems. So whether or not you can ever vote, if you have a felony on your record, determined upon what state you live. So you can live in Vermont and you will never lose the right to vote in prison or out. But if you move to Tennessee, there's a chance that you might be disenfranchised for life. Uh, so you're the same American citizen, but you're treated totally differently. Likewise, and depending upon jurisdiction uh, and sometimes race, uh, if you are a youth, you will either end up in prison, either in a juvenile justice facility or an adult prison, or maybe you won't end up in prison at all. And that depends utterly on where you live. Sometimes it, it even depends upon what city you live in because the choice of whether or not you go into adult prison or you stay in a youth facility is dependent upon a prosecutor, not the law necessarily. There's absolute discretion in some places. Also, you can get a life sentence in one jurisdiction because maybe you have uh, three robberies, your third robbery, you get you, and you've never harmed a single person. In fact, maybe you, you stole a videotape. Uh, you're going to end up in prison for life, maybe, if you're in Louisiana. Whereas if you were in Colorado, you might get a two or five year sentence. So you can see that our system is very unequal. Uh, and it makes it, you have to ask yourself, what is justice? If the same offense could mean a life sentence for one person and, and a two or three year stint in prison for another just by virtue of the, their area code. Uh, so then we have to really start questioning, what is this whole thing doing? Um, where, how, how can we call it criminal justice when there is no equality, when it varies so much? And when we have to ask ourselves, what is the value of sending somebody away for life if in another jurisdiction, we're like, that's a minor offense. I've, you, you can serve your time and go home and thrive in the community. Uh, we have a lot of soul searching to do in America about our criminal legal system. And we will never actually be able to deal with our problems of racism, uh, where uh, if you're black or brown, you're, the chance that you're going to end up in prison as a, as a child or an adult 
is you know tenfold what it might be if you were a white person with the same conduct. Um, that alone tells us that we have work to do, that our system is very, very broken, and we have to start talking about not just reform, but transformation. Brian, could you comment about the state of Texas, which is, uh, you know, California and Texas are, are just so huge and geographically diverse, different regions uh, within Texas, uh, you know, are, are, are very different. Could you just sort of paint a picture of, of, of how you see just, just the one state? We, Amy was talking about a national picture, uh, but um, how do you see the state of Texas in that regard in terms of, of what happens uh, to people as they, as they enter the process and as they're as they go through this this process of being tried and sentenced and so on. Yeah, you know, for our population, there's very much the belief that theoretically there's equal justice under the law, but it boils down to how much justice can you afford? And most of our guys can't afford very much justice. And so uh, they typically get assigned a court appointed attorney uh, who is just going to push for a plea deal. Uh, and, and I think that's Typically what happens, a lot of times guys sign for um, uh, sentences that they probably didn't agree with, but they don't have the wherewithal or the knowledge of how to combat that crime and, and come through that whole process in, in a better, uh, more strategically valuable situation. Uh, and so, you know, it's interesting, there are the dichotomies of the large counties, Houston, uh, uh, Harris County, uh, Dallas County, uh, Bear County and San Antonio and things like that. So th there's a lot of resources there, but it's a machine. It's, I, I don't know, it's the puppy mill. It's the, it's the cookie cutter. Uh, let, let's spit them through. We've got so many people to go. And then we've got the, uh, the smaller counties that don't have the resources to provide. Uh, and perhaps you get a little bit more of a relational representation in the smaller counties, but that I've seen that that doesn't necessarily you know, change how things turn out. It really boils down to, I think, uh, uh, dollars and cents is how much justice can you afford? So it's geography, it's race, and it's wealth. And, and those three factors are, are actually systematically uh, tilting um, our, our, our system. How do, we, how do we address that? I mean, we're, we're going through criminal justice um, reform right now. We're looking at qualified immunity, either for uh, departments or individual officers. There are other uh, sentencing um, issues that are being addressed, but it seems that wealth, geography, and race um, are, are these intractable problems. That's not something that, that is easy to address uh, on a national basis or even on a local basis. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian, how, how do we deal with that? Well, I'll tell you, our approach is kind of the micro approach. We're going to deal with this one person at a time, kind of from the bottom up. You know, policy wise, kind of top down, that's not our, our space. And so we're dealing uh, with guys and telling them, like, look, life is not fair. And life is not fair only in criminal justice. It's not fair in many places. And so you've got to learn to deal with that. You've got to learn to overcome. And we're going to show you how to get in community and have a different vision for your life and, and survive and thrive and get through that um, because it's just not our space to work with legislation and policy. We're, we're coming from the bottom up. So, um, uh, Amy, we just completed another poll. Um, uh, we asked, uh, would you hire or rent an apartment uh, you own to someone coming out of prison? And we ended up with 71% uh, said that they have concerns but could be convinced. And there, then there were, other, uh, there were other responses. In terms of, of from, from your perspective, not running a program like Brian has, but if you were to advise me, advise me, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a small business owner. Um, you know, if I had an apartment uh, to rent and I have concerns, if I were part of the 71%, in theory, yes, but practically haven't yet. And, and I have concerns. How do, how do you address those concerns so that I can be part of a solution? And then I'm going to come to you, Brian. How, how, how do you deal with that? I think it is tough, there's no question. But one of the things we need to do is stop <laughs> passing laws and regulations that make it difficult for people to reintegrate. So where we've seen some successes is to directly involve the business community uh, and communities at large in reintegration. 
it should be part of our job as a society and as local communities to bring people back in. And part of that is that we need to not separate people so much on the front end. Um, we need to not have that iron wall between the community and prisons so that people don't know what's happening in prison. They've never been to a prison. They think they've never met anybody who's been to a prison and they're able to turn away and not know what happens there. Uh, the only reason we have such brutal, horrible facilities is because the public doesn't know what happens and because we've made it so easy for them not to know. Uh, we're investing $80 billion at least a year in our criminal legal system in those prisons. We should actually know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it and hold them accountable in the same way we hold other government programs accountable. But we don't do that in this country. We have almost no oversight of prisons and jails. And as a result, we only know what happens when somebody is killed, murdered, raped, when it is too late to help. Um, I can tell you as somebody, who, and, and I'm sure Brian has stories too, who've been in and out of these facilities for uh, two decades now, they are brutal, horrible, inhumane places. So we have to stop doing that. We have to make these places actually rehabilitative, uh, not just in name, but in fact. And part of that is making sure that the public and our elected leaders go into those facilities, that they have access, that they are open, that they are transparent, and not these lock boxes, these little shops of horror that nobody knows about. Uh, and part of that also, it's important for the community to not then be afraid. Like go into a prison and meet people. They are just like you and me. Um, it is not, as, as we talked about earlier, this idea that there are good people and bad people. Who amongst us wants to be judged solely by the worst thing we've ever done? None of us would pass any litmus test if that was the case. So you know, for some people and others, yeah. You, you know, one of the things that I that I've read about you, Brian, is that is that this is not what what Amy is saying is doesn't come out of a bleeding heart sensibility. It basically is about what works, right? I mean, you know, we, we found that mass incarceration just hasn't worked. Recidivism rates are too high, and and so on and so forth. Right. So, so could you talk about the non bleeding heart side of what works? Because this model in Texas is so interesting. What works? Why does it work? You know, there's a real fiscal responsibility that I think that we have. This is not just hug a thug. This is not just a bleeding heart thing. But um, I, let me give you some rough numbers. That, it's it, also money, right? I mean, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's actually cheaper. Yeah, so it uh, on average across the country, it costs us about $30,000 a year to incarcerate an individual. And if we get that guy out of prison and he does not go back and earns just $30,000 a year, which I think there's a higher trajectory for our guys, but if he earns just 30, that's a $60,000 swing on the tax base per year. It's fiscally responsible for us to keep them out of uh, prison and make them a producer in our communities. It, it's better for us fiscally. We've had a third party evaluation from uh, the Initiative for Competitive Inner City, Michael Porter's uh, group out of Boston, who found that our little old nonprofit in Texas with at the time about a $2.8 million budget made a $122 million impact per year in the state of Texas in decreased incarceration costs, but also in adding to our tax base in uh, job formation and entrepreneurship and uh, just increased dollars into the communities. And so it's fiscally responsible for us to do this. Plus you create ambassadors into the community for, for uh, community change. So when we're talking about urban blight and, and centers of criminality and so on and so forth, who do you send? You send ex-warriors, right? Who have perhaps in the past committed errors that they see around them and can be instructive to those, to, to create those from, from those centers of crime, you can create centers of healing. So it's it, it's it, it, it's just a very interesting thing. I'm I'm all about effective. I'm not about liberal or or conservative or any of that stuff. I'm about what works. And if you have something that works, deploy that model, right? Yeah. So to, to your question earlier about you know how do we impact society to tip that viewpoint 
of how they're viewing returning citizens. And, you know, our approach has been, again, grassroots. I'm going to the employers, selling them on the idea of hiring our release participants, telling them, hey, we've worked with character uh, on the inside. We've also worked with uh, business understanding. They know how business systems work. They want to come add value to their company. Will you give them a shot? And typically they will. I can, I can usually talk them into that. And about two weeks later, I'm going to get a call from that business owner and he'll say, oh my gosh, your guy rivals uh, with the best employees that I've got. You know, he shows up every time. Uh, he's, he's on time. He works hard. He's loyal. He really appreciates his opportunity. He's got a great attitude. I want some more. Can you send me some more? We just completed a poll and we're going to come to the end because we're at the end of our time. We could, we could go for another half hour um, uh, easily. Um, uh, we just completed a poll in which 54% um, of the people said that they believe that the system of mass incarceration causes damage by driving up recidivism and prison populations and exacerbates uh, crime rates over time. And, and the system needs to be significantly uh, revamped. Amy, we're going to give you the last word. If, if, if we look at the whole idea of incarceration, the criminal justice system, um, re-entry, if we take this and we put it into one category, a continuum, where imprisonment is necessary in certain cases, right? But exiting also is important, right? Being able to heal is, is absolutely part of, of, of the issue. Uh, are we talking about um, a, a shift in perspective in which the expertise of these various components reconfigures how resources are deployed to create better impacts. Is that, is that really what we're about? Instead of thinking about defunding or, 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 um, or throwing rocks you know, against uh, somebody, don't we just sort of all have to get into a room and say, how do we produce better results? I mean, that's what businesses do, right? Right, right. certainly looking at creating a system that produces positive results for people is where we need to start instead of the negative uh, focus that we have in the criminal justice system now. Uh, and building a system that incarcerates far fewer people because we put people in prison for reasons they don't need to be in. If we had drug treatment, mental health care treatment oh, in the community, we have vast swaths of the population would stay home. But for those who do go to prison because of serious offenses, we still need to uh, and we, we argue for this at the sentencing project, cap all sentences at, 20, at a 20 year max and give people the opportunity to go back to the court to prove that they can be safe in, in the community at intervals before that 20 years. So that the system focuses on rehabilitation from day one. What are we gonna do? We're gonna use prison as a crisis intervention in that person's life. Yes, to deter bad conduct, but also to help that person figure out how to live safely in the community for themselves and for others, to give them skills. I mean, we can actually educate lawyers, doctors, rocket scientists in far less than 10 years with far fewer resources than we use in the criminal justice system. Why aren't we focusing on really rehabilitating people, giving them the skills they need to thrive in the community and then supporting them when they're out rather than what we do now, which is set them up to fail. And if we Brian, do that, we can make a system that actually works for everyone. Brian, I'll actually come back to you. I, I, have, I, I have one other question, and then, and, and then we'll, we'll exit this. We're about to go into an election cycle in which criminal justice is going to be a big issue. Um, there is, there have been, uh, there's been an uptick in certain um, gun-related um, violent crimes. Um, there has been an uptick in, in uh, concern. Uh, coming out of this traumatic period, uh, coming out of COVID and the economic impacts there. How should we all be thinking about this as we, we are exposed to what will inevitably be, uh, you know, a bit of demagoguery and, and fear and loathing, you know, surrounding this issue? How should I as a voter, how should I as somebody who really cares about a safe society, but also a thriving society, how should I think about this? You know, I love what Amy just said about crisis intervention, and we should view our prison systems like that. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic and the greatly decreased 
number of volunteers who go into our prisons, at least down here, uh, there is going to be a negative impact on the guys who are coming out for the next year or so because they have not had uh, the modicum of interaction going on that they normally would have. And so it's it's going to be a little tough patch that we're going to go through. But I love that idea is, you know, if somebody's going to prison, we want to get them out, want to get them out of that desperate situation where it puts society in harm. But that is a cry for help that we should all see as a society. We need to lean in to that, not shun and push it away. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this has been very instructive, and I'm sorry uh, that, that we've taken a little bit longer, but it, but it's so worth it. Amy Fedick, uh, Executive Director of the Sentencing Project in Washington, D.C., Brian Kelly, CEO of the Prison Entre Entrepreneurship uh, Program in Texas. Thank you so much for the work of for your work, for the work of your staff, for the work of your board, your volunteers and the ecosystem, the funders who, who support you. And thank you so much for sharing this really interesting uh, set of insights that you've provided us uh, today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure. Thank you.